the peace in your reservoir. Oh, and so tonight, God, we just receive that. We receive your peace, your shalom, your sufficiency that reaches down into every area of our life, every area of our heart. And we thank you for the peace of God that passes all understanding, that makes no sense in the natural, but in the supernatural, God, it is a gift, it is a provision, it is part of our salvation. And so we thank you for that tonight, God. Oh, hallelujah. Are you excited about being in the presence of God? Are you excited about the promises of God? Oh, are you thankful that they are yes and amen? Right? That's right. God has already said yes. We say, so be it, Father. Your will, your way in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so much, worship team. Thank you for guiding us and directing us as we worship the Father and enter into his presence. So our youth tonight, we want to go ahead and dismiss you over with Pastor Richard. He's waving right there. They've got a great word for you tonight and a great plan for you tonight. So go and learn about Jesus. Well, good evening, church. My name is Teresa. I'm one of the ministers here at The Rock, and it is my honor and my privilege to get to bring the word to you tonight and to just dive into the word of God and let our hearts be filled with faith, right? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I believe that this is a season where you and I, as the Church of the Living God, we need to be filling our hearts with faith, right? We need to be consuming the Word of God. We need to be finding it in our every day so that we are built up and strengthened, so that we are equipped to do everything that God is calling His church to do in this season. And it's not to wait out and hide out and isolate, right? But it's to be the Church of the Living God in our world and in the places that He's called us to. So tonight, with that excitement, expectancy in the Word of God, that the Word works. Let's go ahead and pray just for this time of listening in His presence, and then we'll dig in. Hallelujah, Lord, I thank you first for everything that you've already done in our midst. Here with the people who've gathered, God, and those that are online tonight watching, I thank you that you've touched them, Lord God, that you've ministered to them, that you've brought to each one of us, Lord God, a call to your presence tonight, Lord, and we respond as your people. We say yes to what you want to do, yes to what you are doing, Lord God. And so, Father, I thank you that as we hear your word, we're going to hear and obey. We're going to respond. We pray for open hearts, Lord God, that we would receive the Spirit of God to come in and do what it is that you want to do in our hearts and in our lives. And, Lord God, we pray for everybody who's gathering tonight. If there are other churches, Father, they're far between, but if they are gathering tonight to proclaim your word, we pray for them also. Bless them. Show up. Minister there, God. Fill their, fill their place with your presence, oh God, that congregation. We thank you that you are in the midst of them, Father, that you are changing lives and restoring just like you're doing here, oh God. And we pray for everybody who is online, Father, gathered in homes, in house parties, in watch parties, tuning in because they're hungry for God. We speak a blessing over them. We thank you, God, that where two or three are gathered together in your name, that you are in the midst of them. And so we thank you for your tangible, manifested presence in those houses right now, Lord God. Thank you that you are ministering wherever your people are gathered tonight, Lord. We give you honor, we give you glory, and we thank you for all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, as I looked at tonight and what the Holy Spirit would have me to share, I remembered an event in my life way back when, way back yonder, when I was young enough to officially be part of that overflow crew, like so many of you are, is back in 1998, I had graduated and finished Bible school. I was 26 years old, and um, I have this memory about my journey home from that trip away. And it was my flight back home after being finished with Bible school. And um, there was something about this flight that was so memorable. But let me give you some context before I jump into what happened in that flight. Uh, when it comes to flying, you know, on commercial airplanes, uh, it's not something that's rare for me, 
Right now, I usually fly two or three times a year. You know, always have either going to the East Coast or going somewhere else. So I'm on airplanes quite a bit. It's not an unusual thing, right? I don't enjoy flying at all. Some of my friends who've flown with me will be able to tell you why. Um, because this thing about the G-force when you take off, oh, my stomach doesn't like that. And then that whole thing about air pressure changing when you come down, oh, my stomach doesn't like that. So if you know what I mean and you have that similar problem, you can relate to some of that. So anytime we're in the air on a flight and the air pressure changes, if you've flown very much, you know exactly what happens, right? That plane stops cruising through those sunny skies and all of a sudden there's some turbulence, right? There's some jolting. There's a sudden unexpected change that you didn't know was going to come. And then that unexpected change can produce fear, right? It produces fear because you didn't know that it was coming. You didn't know, you didn't have it planned. It wasn't there in front of you. And I can tell you that on all the flights that I've taken over the years, many of them have been turbulent. Many of them have had an event where there was some shaking in the sky. There was some uncomfortableness in the sky. But the thing about this particular flight is that when we started to take off, there was nothing calm about the flight at all. We were in midair and all of a sudden unexpected, it's a transatlantic flight, we drop. We literally dropped. It was like the bottom fell out from underneath us. Nothing could have predicted what was about to come. Do you know what happened in that airplane at that moment? It was filled with fear. There was gasping, there was uncertainty. You can feel the tension in the air because nobody knew what was about to happen, right? I'm pretty sure that those armrests were being held tighter than they had ever been held before because the unexpected had come into our situation. The unexpected had come into our lives and suddenly there was uncertainty in our midst. And uncertainty, right, uncertainty brings the unknown. And the unknown is a trigger for fear. When we get into the unknown, there is the potential for fear to rise up. And when we fear, then there's the opportunity to open up the door and we let it in, it can turn into worry. And that worry, when it's had its place, taken hold in our soul, can become anxiety. Uncertainty gives a place, an invitation to fear. Fear can create a habit of worry, and worry can develop anxiety in our soul. Back in 2018, the American Psychiatric Association published a study tracking anxiety here in the United States. And what they found is that people are anxious, mostly anxious about three things, their health, their safety, and their finances. And when I say Americans are anxious about these three things, the statistics were like this, 68%. That is, out of three people, every two out of those three in the United States is anxious on a normal basis about their safety, about their health, and about their finances. Anxiety. So what is this anxiety? One of the things I thought was interesting about the study when I read it is we hear a lot about anxiety in the younger generation, anxiety in the millennials. I, as a high school chemistry teacher, I see a lot of anxiety in my students or they're talking about my anxiety, right? My depression. And there's something that's, that's happened a lot and we see that. And so the study showed that in the millennial generation this is the highest percentage. But it wasn't just there. They saw that in one year, from 2017 to 2018, anxiety in baby boomers jumped 7%. So it isn't just the young people. It's happening across the spectrum, this idea of anxiety. So the Bible tells us this in Proverbs 20, 12, 25. It says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down. That tells us right there, it's not God's gift. It's not part of his salvation plan. It's not the way that he wants us to live. So what is anxiety? Anxiety is simply this, from a dictionary perspective, 
right? A feeling of worry or unease regarding an imminent event or uncertain outcome. Worry or unease about something in the future that could happen, might happen, possibly could happen, right? Now, now don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that if you ever have a feeling of worry or unease that that's sin and something's wrong with that. Not at all, right? Our feelings are our God-given indicators that help us process what's happening in the world. They tell us that something's not right, right? Something inside of us or around us and it needs to be addressed. So when those feelings of unease or uncertainty come, we act on them, right? We act with wisdom and we adjust the situation. But that's not what this is. What we're talking about is when we let it in and let it, let it have its way in our soul. If we don't ever have a feeling of unease or concern, right, then something's wrong with us. We're totally detached from the world, and that's not good either, right? So there is a level of healthy, of healthy unease, of healthy concern, of healthy fear, but then we process it and we act on it and we adjust whether it's our soul or our circumstances so that it doesn't find place inside of us. That's what God would have us to do. So I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying here today. But if anxiety was already on the rise in our country before the day we're living in today, before this novel new coronavirus showed itself up several months ago on the earth, imagine how much more the level of anxiety in people's life concerning their health, their safety, and their finances, because we've seen it hit all three of those areas, right? We see it happening in our economy. We see it happening in the world around us, right? Before there was no masks to be purchased, before the schools started closing, before you went down the aisle of Costco or Walmart and could not find any toilet paper. Not sure what the connection is there, but it's happening, right? There's toilet paper <laughs> has become part of the fear and the anxiety, right? The enemy's in the invitation to us, to people, to humanity, in the midst of this uncertainty, of this inconvenient, uncertain fact, kind of like the airplane right, dropping down underneath you and you all of a sudden your seat is much lower than you expected. Right? All of a sudden, there's this opportunity in our society to have fear, to lead to worry, and to allow ourselves to become anxious. Because right? that's what it is. He's, he's placed an invitation, created a scenario that we could step into his way of doing life and being. Right? And that would be to enter into what is already natural for so many people on our earth to deal with things with anxiety. One of the signs of anxiety is unhealthy coping. And we're seeing a lot of that in our world, right? We're seeing people panic. We're seeing people hoard. We're seeing people make irrational decisions like the toilet paper. I mean, that's literally irrational, right? So we're seeing that, and, but in the same way that the virus is contagious, psychiatry has found that anxiety is contagious. When we get around it, it wants to jump on you. The people who are experiencing it deeply want to draw you in with the hopes that maybe you can help fix it. But we aren't the ones who fix it, right? But we need to be aware, we need to be intelligent, we need to be wise to what's happening and what the ploys of the enemy are in our world so that we can do what God has called us to do. So today what I want to talk about now that we've painted a scenario of what's happening in our world is what is God's invitation in the midst of this situation that can be so anxious, right? That's why I've entitled this message, right? That what, are, what is the title? I forgot already. Anxious for nothing, right? You know, you, when you're writing a title, you make a few choices. So this is where it landed. Anxious for nothing. So we're going to go ahead and start. If you want to open your Bibles today, there's a lot of scriptures I'm going to go over, but mainly two places. That's Philippians 4 and Proverbs 3. So those are the two places I would put my finger as we go through this teaching today. Be anxious for nothing, Ephesians 4, 6 says, but in everything 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God's invitation is that we don't fear as others do. Right? God's invitation is that we don't process and accept anxiety like the world does. Because we are in this world, but we are not of this world. That's exactly right. So maybe you're hearing this tonight, and your spirit man is saying, yes, thank God I am in this world, but not of the world. Maybe you're here tonight, and you have no inclination to process what's happening in our world towards fear and worry and anxiety. And I say, praise God. Praise God for what God's doing inside of your heart and what you've already developed in your spirit man. But maybe you're also here tonight or watching online and you can relate to what's been going on in the spirit world. You feel like, you know what, I've let the news, I've let the social media scrolling, I've let the radio, I've let all the things that I've been hearing begin to form levels of worry, fear, and anxiety in my life. Then I have a word for you tonight. There is freedom for you tonight, right? And if you are in a place where you're like, you know what, it's not even hitting me because God's word alive on the inside of me, then you know what, tonight you're going to be equipped. Equipped to do what? Equipped to take that peace out to the world that's outside of these doors. Because even though we might be walking around with peace, they're not. And you know, he left you and me. Jesus left us right here. He didn't zap us out at salvation moment so that we could carry his peace to our world. So we could be the church of Jesus Christ. So in both cases, I want you to listen closely to what God has for all of us tonight. When I sat on that plane on my way home from Bible school so many years ago, and I felt that sense, that opportunity for fear, I remember checking my soul and noticing that it wasn't responding the way everybody else's was. I looked down and I saw my feet. I was sitting in that seat where there's a wall in front of you, and my feet were just up, relaxed, you know, got him propped up, and I was like, what's happening around me? And here's what I realized in that moment. I, I prayed immediately, right? And I began to thank God that I knew the plans he had for me. I began to thank God that he didn't send me to Bible school to kill me on the way home, right? I knew that God's plans were bigger than, I had no idea what they were, but I knew they were going to be awesome, right? that he had invested in me and there was a purpose. And so there was no place for that because I had spent a year learning about who my God was. I had spent a year learning about the God of the universe in ways that I had never imagined that I would know him. So I wanna to start tonight with how do we get peace or how do we help others get peace, right? How can we be in a situation where we are anxious for nothing. The first thing I want to say, and that's essential for us, is to remember that God is good. Yeah. Sounds so basic, but it's so important. It's so fundamental to who He is. We need to know and be confident in the character of our God, right? Flip over. Proverbs 3 was the other place I asked you to hold a spot. And I'm going to start just in the middle. We're going to play and talk around these verses a little bit tonight. But I'm going to start in verse 22, just because I want you to see about how God is good. It says, so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. And when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Those are the words, that is the desire of a good God, right? God is good, right? He's not describing here somebody who is anxious or fearful. When you can lay your head down in peace at night, that says something about the condition of your soul, right? He's the God who wants us to have grace. He wants us to walk safely. He wants us to not be afraid. All of these are signs of a good God. You know, Jesus, he gave us a, a job description for what the enemy does and what he does, right? In John 10, 10, he said it like this. The thief comes, our adversary, the enemy, the thief. He comes only to steal, to kill, 
and to destroy. I came, Jesus said, talking about himself. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, right? God is good. He's revealed the enemy's strategy. The enemy has one mission, kill, steal, and destroy. There's nothing good about that, right? If the enemy had his way, this new coronavirus wouldn't be called a novel virus. It would be called a normal virus. Why? Because he would be spewing out destruction, right? He would be making sure that every person is sick and broken down and crushed and in pain. That's his goal. But God in his mercy is keeping that from happening, right? He's holding back. It's not why did God let this happen. Every once in a while, evil pokes its head through, but God in his mercy is holding back corrupt destruction. He's holding back corruption on our earth. God is doing that. Don't take my word for it. Take the Word's word for it. Take a look at Lamentations. Lamentations 3.22 says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because that's the plan of the enemy. That's his desire, is to consume, not just the church. He hates people because God loves them. Right, that's his plan, is utter destruction across the earth. But it is the goodness of God that restrains evil, that restrains the enemy, that allows us to experience goodness and hope and peace and plenty and abundance and joy and relationships and community. That is what God is doing on the earth. God is keeping us. His mercy keeps us. Right? His grace keeps us. Why? Because God is good. Let's never get that wrong, church. Let's never let the world, the media, tell us anything different. John 17, 23, there's something so beautiful in this prayer of Jesus, known as the high priestly prayer. The only prayer that we had, Jesus actually praying to the Father that's recorded for us. So the things that he says take on this extra importance. And he says this, I in them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me. He's telling the Father that the Father sent him, Jesus. And that you, the Father, and you loved them. I know God loves me. You're probably sitting here tonight. You know God loves you. But look what he says next even as you have loved me. God loves you the same way he loves Jesus. The Father's love for the Son is exactly the same as his love for me and for you. Dwell in that. Sit in that. Meditate on that. As the chaos of the world comes screaming across our screens, God loves me as much, the same as he loves Jesus. Let that sink into our hearts tonight. Let's dwell on that, that God is good. 1 John 4, 18 goes on to say, first part of the verse says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The love that God loves me with and loves you with, that's a perfect love. That love casts out, pushes out, replaces the fear of this world. So when you feel like, hey, I feel like some of this stuff that's in the world is getting on me. Like the invitation of the enemy to fear, to worry, to be anxious, sit. We've been doing Psalms 91, who dwells in the secret place of most. That means to sit, yeah. Yeah. right? How about sitting in his love this week? Yeah. Sitting, just sitting in it, just reminding yourself of the love of God for you, the love of God for the world that he so loves, that his goodness is present in the midst of the enemy's invitation to let worry, anxiety, preoccupation come in and take that place. We could go on forever, 
about the goodness of God in this Bible revealed to us because he's good and it's about him. One more scripture before we move on. 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. That's what I knew on that plane when my seat dropped below me, I was supposed to be connected to it, right? That he is faithful. Yeah. You and I may be unfaithful. Our walk may be uncertain. We may go through ups and downs, but God is faithful and he's the one that guards us from the evil one. He's the one that puts his mercy like a shield about us. He's the one that is our strong tower and our bulwark. He's the one. Oh, you want to talk about building a wall? His wall has been built around you. He is your guard and he guards us. He keeps us. The word says that we are held in the palm of his hand. So tonight, the first thing that we need to do to make sure that we accept God's invitation in the midst of a storm, in the midst of turmoil, is to remember, to remind our souls that God is good. Amen. God is good. God is good. Second thing. Oh, I did have a note here I wanted to mention. You know, after a year of Bible school, I could summarize everything I learned in this statement. God is good, the devil is bad, have faith in God, right? And that's what came up in that moment when things got uncertain to you, uncertain, when my physical realm seemed to drop underneath me, God is good, the devil is bad, have faith, have faith in God. Despite what the circumstances look like, have faith in God. So the second thing which takes us right there is after we've reminded ourselves that God is good, then we've got to stay steady and focus, focus, focus on God. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter three. We read these verses earlier. So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. And when you lie down, you won't be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. None of these are the characteristics of an anxious or fearful, fearful person. But I want us to go backwards. I want us to go up to the verses right before that so we can figure out why that first word is there that says so. So because of what I just said. All these wonderful things are God's provision. So let's back up a little in your Bible up to verse 19. It says, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Let them, my son, let them, what? What's them? What I just told you about God. Stay focused on who God is, my son. Let them, God's wisdom, God's understanding, God's knowledge, the God who it says here, by wisdom founded the earth, the God who out of nothing created everything. The God who creatively designed all of the universe around us. The God who said, let there be light and light begin to travel and it's still traveling, ladies and gentlemen. We will never get to the end of the galaxies because they keep expanding because once God sent out his word, it just keeps going. That God, keep that before you, my son. Keep the God whose knowledge and understanding and wisdom put everything together that's together. This heavens and the earth and the way that it all functions, there's nothing random about that, right? It is divinely designed and created through a mind that's incredibly inconceivable to you and I. And this proverb, this is reminding us to keep those things the God who made everything functional and beautiful, 
the creative God, to not let who he is depart from our eyes, but to focus when there's so many other things that want our focus, to focus on God. Why? Because when our eyes move and shift away from God and they begin to focus on the dilemma, that's when that sense of no hope comes in. That's when that sense of lack comes in and uncertainty comes in and worry because we're looking not at the answer, but at the problem. We've shifted and have our eyes in the wrong place. And then there's no hope. And then darkness, right? And then anxiety. And then we get into this dark place. But we need to come out by keeping our eyes on who our creator is, that good, good God. So again, in Proverbs 3, a little further down in that same passage that we've been reading, it says this in verse 24. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. Why? Why don't I have to be afraid? Here's why. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being cut. He will be your confidence. He will keep your foot. What's my part? To remember who he is, to keep my eyes on him, to know that he's the God that has all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding. I don't have to understand it. As a matter of fact, if I try, I'm just going to get mind blown. You know that little emoji where the brains are being blown? That's what, trying to picture and imagine what God is, but he's revealed himself to us as good, as wise, as creative, as understanding, and we can trust in that. We can build our life on that. We can care for our soul on that. It's a fight. It's a fight. Because that cell phone, that iPad, that radio station, that television, that cable, that's speaking fear, 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 right? But faith is a fight. And what are we fighting? We're fighting fear, right? First Timothy tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Faith has an enemy. It has an opponent. It has an opposite. And that's fear. So we have to intentionally focus on God. We have to make an effort. I don't know what your effort was like before this season, before this invasion of this virus, but whatever it is, let's double it. Let's press in. Let's be determined so we have enough, not just for us, but for those around us. So that when we get pushed, when we get squeezed, when we get bumped, it pours out of us because we are filling ourselves with who God is and we know that he is good. And we've chosen, you've chosen, you're here tonight. You've chosen, you're watching online to stay in the fight. We're not running, we're not hiding, but we are in the fight of faith, ready to do what God has called us to do. Third thing, remember God is good. Focus on God. And last thing for tonight, be intentional about inviting God in. Yeah. Inviting God in. You know, when we, we're focusing on him and we lift our eyes to him and we turn to him, you know what happens? That same creative God who knew how to put the planets in place, knew how to suspend everything on nothing, right? Right? We'll begin to drop creative ideas, creative solutions, creative ways into your mind and mind. When we invite him in to our situation, he's going to drop in his ideas. Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The God of the universe is working and wants to work in me and in you 
to do and to will for his good pleasure. He's got a plan, he's got a strategy, he's got a way through. You run out of toilet paper, God knows where to get your needs met. Ah, oh, that's funny, but it's true. It's true. It doesn't matter what you lack, what you need. It doesn't matter if in all of your imaginations, you spent days and hours imagining the way that God could answer your prayer. I can tell you what the years of experience has told me. Every way that I imagine, he doesn't pick any one of those. He picks a totally different way, but he answers. And he meets our needs when we invite him in. Maybe the answer doesn't come at once because you're in the middle of some fogginess, some uncertainty, fighting to try to keep your mind focused on God. But you know what does come? His presence, his steadfastness, his peace, right? And as we stay in that, and as we stand in that, and as we look to him and remind ourselves who he's in, the answer is going to come. His God idea is going to drop right into your spirit. And you're going to be like, that's crazy, but I'm going to try it. Because I'd have never thought of that. Then I know it's a God idea, right? And the peace that comes with that. Numbers 23, 19 reminds us of who God is. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Here's what I love. Has he said and will not do? Or has he spoken and he will not make good? He's faithful. If he said it, he's gonna do it. If he spoke it, if we recorded it, so that for millennia we would be reminded of his plan and his purposes, he is faithful to fulfill it. He doesn't just talk to talk, he talks because we can build our life on it. His word is more than enough. Let's go back to the verse we started with, Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing. Well, how do I do that? I remember God's good. I stay focused on Him and not everything else. And I take a moment and I say, Lord, here's my situation. I need your ideas. I need your ways. I need your provision. I need the God who has wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to make a way where there is no way I need to give it to you, Lord, be anxious for nothing. Then the opposite of that, but, as opposed to, be anxious even for nothing, now that we're anxious, not anxious, not with an anxious heart, not with a heavy heart, I can come to God in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving because of who He is. Not because of what my situation looks like, not because I know the way through just yet, but because I've given it to him. That's it, I've given it, I've done my part. I'm trusting him, I'm taking this at his word. He's faithful, so you know what? I can thank him for those things. I can thank him for the answer. I can thank him that I'm gonna be on the other side of whatever it is that's in front of me, whether it's my health, my resources, right? Whether it's my job, whether it's my relationships, it doesn't matter. I can thank him because of who he is. Let your request be made known to God. Wow. That's the opposite of walking in anxiety and fear and worry. That's the opposite of looking to life to be our solution. Right? It's the opposite of focusing on the problem and instead focusing on the solution. He is our solution. Not from a place of fear, but from a place of faith. A place where our heart has been filled with thanksgiving for the God who loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly. We don't need to be timid. We don't need to be uncertain. We don't need to wonder if God is really interested in our situation. The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is yes. Yes. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. If you're a parent in this room, you know what it means to love a child. I'm not a parent, but I tell you what, I got two nieces right there, and I get overwhelmed at the amount of love that floods my hearts for them. I can't even imagine how many times greater it must be to be a parent. God, our Father, what His heart is for us, so we can come boldly to the throne of grace, so that we can obtain mercy. 
Remember, it's his mercies that keep us. It's his mercies that protects us. And find grace, grace, God's power, right? To do what we can't do, right? God's power to do what his word asks of us. Grace that empowers us to do and to live and to be and to endure all that this life has to help. Grace that's gonna help us in our time of need. Let's take a look at the end of that verse in Philippians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This is the exciting part too. <laughs> and the peace of God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. I like the, the paraphrase that says, the peace of God that makes no sense in the natural surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts, guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know what? God's provision is more than enough. He's invited us to chew on this, to believe what he said about himself, and he's going to take care of the rest. He does the guarding. He keeps us. Yeah, we, we think we're keeping ourselves. We're foolish. We're fooling ourselves because there's a battle far greater than us. And God is on our side and he's surrounding us. And his love and his mercy encompass us. You know, after a year of Bible school, I'd never been more fully full of the word of God, more fully entrenched of the word of God so that when that situation came to my life, it wasn't even a thought to turn to God, know his truth, and just walk through it. But that might be an interesting story in itself, but that isn't the best part of the story. That isn't even the point of the story. The point of the story is there was a girl sitting next to me. She was probably my age in her 20s at the time. She was immediately frightened. She was filled from fear from head to toe. She clenched and she, her whole body and I remember looking over at her and being like, don't worry. She's like, no, we're gonna die. And she began to say all of these things I don't remember right now, but she was so full of fear. That's what I remember 20 years later. And I remember telling her, you don't have to worry. You're sitting next to me. <laughs> and she just thought I was the weirdest person on the, I said, God's got a plan for me. Nothing's gonna happen to me. This plane isn't going anywhere. I don't care how much it drops, right? Because I know him and he's invested in me this whole year and he's gonna use me. And there's no way ever that anything is gonna happen to you because I have the peace of God on the inside of me. And you know what happened that day? She got to experience the kingdom of God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, right? You and I are carriers in this season. We are being called out to take it to our world called out not to just be me and mine comfortable not afraid in my house but to take it to where I go to take it to that supermarket line to not knock somebody else for the toilet paper right to be the deliverers of the kingdom of God in our world. This is an opportunity. This is a wide open door for people to see that we don't fear like others fear, right? We fear only him who can cast our soul into hell, not people who can harm our body because we are children of the kingdom of God. That's the best part of that story is that the person next to me got to Rest is a long flight. She slept in peace. She sat in peace. Her mind was blown away. She was, what on earth is this kingdom of God? I got to share with her simply because, simply because I knew that God was good. Simply because I had been focusing on him and not what was happening with that plane. Simply because I was able to invite him and I knew that he would come into my situation. The same is true for you. Tonight, just close your eyes for a minute and allow the Holy Spirit just to minister what he would that you would carry away concretely from this time together. 
Is there anxiety and worry and fear that you've allowed to come into your, to your own heart? Then give it to God. Remind yourself that he is good. Invite him into that place. Maybe tonight you're here and you're like, yes, I'm walking in the peace of God. But God has been calling you out not to keep it for yourself, but to begin to be his lighthouse in your community, a deliverer of the kingdom in your world. And you've been holding back. You've been keeping your peace to yourself. And the Holy Spirit wants to use you to minister to your world. You saying, I don't know how, the God who creatively designed and formed our world has a plan for you. Let's listen for a few minutes to what the Holy Spirit would say. As is our custom here, if you'd like to take out your phone to type it in or a piece of note paper and write down what the Spirit of God has spoken to you so you don't forget or share it with the person next to you, let's do that now. <laughs> 